Our mission used to be about technology first, putting a laptop or a computer on every desktop. Well, that is not exactly the way healthcare functions. Healthcare is more about patients and providers and understanding you know, how we can make their lives better. And when you change the paradigm around, what you find is that your entire business processes will change. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless with the fires that burn within us. But I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take Welcome to the Startup Health Fireside Chat. Each week, we invite forward-thinking leaders in health innovation to join us for candid conversations about their work, but also about our collective health moonshot journey. We hold these conversations each week in front of a live audience of Startup Health founders, and it is my privilege to be hosting you for the next hour. My name is Logan Plaster, and this is just one of the best parts of my job. So excited to see each and every one of your faces on this call. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by our special guest, Dr. David Rue, the Chief Medical Officer and VP of Healthcare at Microsoft. David previously worked as the CMO at Samsung, and for years he's been deeply involved in national organizations dedicated to improving medical technology and health data interoperability. He co-holds six U.S. patents related to electronic health records, and he's an adjunct professor at Sanford. Dr. Rue, it is our pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Logan. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's just start by getting to know you a little bit better. You studied infectious disease. You're a practicing physician. Then you made a career for yourself, a unique career for yourself in healthcare strategy at big tech. So tell us a little bit about that journey and kind of why you made that move. Well, I can tell you it wasn't by design. A large part of my interest was studying how variation in care was resulting in particular outcomes, whether it was worsened care, higher costs, decreased access to care. And it struck me as strange how within a hospital you could have such huge variations. And then when we started looking at it, there was significant variation between hospital and hospital, ultimately trying to understand about why organizations weren't following evidence-based guidelines led us down this path of what is now known as clinical decision support. But back then it was really more around evidence-based guidelines. A lot of my early career was around research, just trying to show that providing the right information at the right time can be influential in terms of decision-making. It can be useful in terms of improving health outcomes and reducing costs. And to automate that or to make that process more scalable, we had to create technologies that were more digital. And those digital technologies ultimately became a product, which became a company. And then that company was eventually acquired by Cerner, which threw me into the whole realm of health IT. So, so you've been in the shoes of some of the folks on this call as a health tech founder. What, what were some of the, the lessons you made? Oh, maybe some of the mistakes you made, some of the things that, looking back were, were big lessons learned from that time as a founder. Well, one of the strange things in retrospect was something that was a bit fortunate was that we came in with the idea that organizations would want to improve quality of care and they would pay for that. Well, wanting to do something and paying for it are two separate issues. <laughs> and uh, Ultimately, we found that the reason why people bought our solution was because of something that was an unexpected expected byproduct of creating an order set and a plan of care in an electronic health record, which is that saved the clinician 95 to 97% of the time entering orders. Clinician dissatisfaction with the EHR was one of the major reasons why EHRs were not being implemented. So this became the tip of the spear for all EHR implementations, developing evidence-based order sets, and plans of care that could be implemented in the EHR so you could go with the go live. So that was kind of the strange thing because we didn't anticipate it. It was really the right product at the right time. But the reason why it got adopted, and I think the key lesson is that focusing on efficiency, ways to make things more cost efficient, more time efficient, leads to the purchase decision. So part of your story is that you know, you've served as the CMO at multiple tech companies. You know, and something that I like to ask to uh, you know physicians 
physicians, trained physicians, is about the role of the physician voice in a, a health tech company. Because maybe it's, it seems obvious, but it's, it's not always the leading voice. And so I, I wonder if you could comment on the importance for health tech companies to have a strong physician voice in their strategy. Another way to think about this is sort of, you know, what do non-physician health tech folks miss about healthcare if they don't have that voice? Yeah, and I would extend that to clinicians. Uh, really, any type of healthcare provider has a unique perspective, and that is that they've seen patients. They know the issues that surround taking care of patients, not just from a patient and a clinician perspective, but just the workflows. A lot of care today is based on workflow. And if you don't understand the workflow and you don't understand what's working well, what's not working well, and then the disruptions that your technology or innovation is going to create, that's a huge issue because largely decisions are made based on how it impacts and improves clinical workflow. And so I would say that's probably one of the first important things, but it's also understanding just where healthcare is going. A lot of times you need to know and not just what the current challenges are from what you've seen, but you, you have an idea of where the, the industry is going and some of the things that need to be done to make it better. Just to get really uh, practical, do you think that that means for a startup that it's important to have a clinician as a part of a founding team, an early advisor, at some point have an advisor? It's sort of how soon and how important is it for a startup? Yeah, I'd say, you know, startup, medium-sized, large company, every, every organization needs to have that perspective of the voice of the customer and knowing those pain points. And largely what I found is that it's useful if the person is part of the organization, but at a minimum, there should be some type of an ongoing advisory role. Okay, I'm sure uh, folks on this call are curious about Microsoft's trajectory in healthcare. So I kind of want you to pull back the curtain for us a little bit. We'll get into specific tools next, but I'm thinking more high-level strategy right now. Uh, can you just help us understand Microsoft's vision for healthcare in 2021, some of the moves it wants to make in the upcoming year? Well, I'm going to start seven years ago when Microsoft hired Satya Nadella to be the CEO, and that changed the culture and the mission. Our mission used to be about technology first, putting a laptop or a computer on every desktop. Well, that is not exactly the way healthcare functions. Healthcare is more about patients and providers and understanding you know, how we can make their lives better. And when you change the paradigm around, what you find is that your entire business processes will change. So at Microsoft, our mission changed to empowering every individual, every organization around the world to be able to achieve more and to be able to accomplish those goals that they thought never were possible. So technology is now an enabler as opposed to it being the star of the show. And I think that's a large part of what we've been doing over the past several years is building the technology that supports healthcare. And to do that, what we realized is that we do have some great tools, but they're not healthcare specific, or I should say they weren't at one point. But what we did is we made them HIPAA compliant. We enabled data interoperability so that data could flow through the different systems so that if you work in Azure or modern workplace in Teams or Dynamics or Power Platform, now the data can flow. And now you've got a whole array of different tools that can be used to help better support your, your industry. And in healthcare, it's not just about one aspect. I think a lot of times people think, you know, maybe for cloud computing, it's about storage and compute. Well, that's a big part of it. But once that information is brought in, it has to be acted on. And so now you get into this whole issue around, well, does it integrate with the electronic health record? What's the clinical workflow? Do you have tools like Teams where people can collaborate? Do you have storage places like SharePoint that allows you to be able to tap into different sources? Is it using specific industry standards? And I think that now we're realizing that the reason why healthcare is complicated, because it's not just a one size fits all, it's there's an element here of integration into clinical workflows, existing systems, but then building off of that with tools that can be scalable and interoperable and secure. You stretch back seven years thinking about Microsoft's current healthcare strategy. How did COVID, how did COVID change or shift that strategy, if at all? Yeah. So I was with Microsoft for about a year, then COVID hit. And you know, as you can imagine, as with everyone, we were sort of down this path of developing our technologies. And then when COVID hit, everyone's interest, and, and we're not talking just in healthcare, but across the globe, shifted to how do we address the ongoing needs? First and foremost, get information about, do I have the infection? Do I need to be seen by a doctor? That type of triage was something that current systems were not well handled to to basically do. And one of the first things we did was a pivot towards use of the healthcare bot, chatbot functionality to make it something that could be used by anyone 
to answer questions. That give, gave us an incredible insight because once we started using that, we customized it and we actually deployed it with the CDC. And in fact, if you go to the CDC website, you'll see that the chatbot is a Microsoft chatbot that's derived around answering questions. But it also allowed for a digital handoff to telehealth, which was also a, uh, an emerging you know, trend where we saw that that was something that needed to be done and facilitated through that chatbot. And then we realized that, boy, in that same encounter, we might be able to help individuals enroll into clinical trials or perhaps at the time plasma donation was a consideration. So just understanding where an individual is and their questions and concerns is an opportunity for us to be able to start helping them to the next step along the journey. That helps us sort of at the uh, 30,000 foot level, understand the strategy and kind of where you're thinking. I want to uh, switch now and talk a bit about tech tools. We can't really talk about Microsoft with really, without talking about the tech infrastructure that you've built and how startups can use it and how you sort of uh, have a vision for startups using it. Kind of breaking down, what do you think they should be thinking about offloading versus doing themselves? What are the things you, they shouldn't be reinventing the wheel on that, that you're working on? So I don't know, we could start with Microsoft Cloud for healthcare and sort of build from there. So to give you an idea what Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, it sounds like it's just a branding exercise, but the reality is what we realized is there's three aspects to improving health outcomes. There's a data ingest piece where you have to bring in different data sets from different sources. So data could come from electronic health records. That's clearly one of the major sources. And there could, you know, and clearly there's uh, other sources that are standardized sets like uh, claims data sets. But then as we start thinking about different, I guess, other areas, you know, devices are another area, internet of medical things and all the different types of uh, wearables that people may have. We may find that social determinants of health are another, you know, people say that your zip code is actually a greater determinant of your outcome. So as we think about how these different data sets come in, Microsoft has a whole suite of APIs to be able to pull these different data sets in. So again, not having or not relying on the organizations to build those APIs and the servers, but just basically relying on certain things that are more out of the box. Now, once you actually start thinking about how the data thing gets ingested and or normalized and analyzed, you'll say, wow, I need to apply some AI on top of that. So there'd be some proprietary algorithms that are built, but some of those are things that could be highly huge benefit if they were incorporated with, let's say, free text. So, you know, free text is a huge source of untapped information. Now, what's or, a lot of organizations I see is they start building NLP engines to start focusing on text analysis or visual analytics or voice. Well, what if those are available? And they are. And so that's another area where Microsoft, we spent a significant amount of time developing these tools so that startups and other companies can take full advantage of them. And you may have heard about the recent announcement with Nuance. Um, I mean, that's just a reflection of our deep investment into natural language processing. And then the third is just around pushing that out to tools that people will use every day. Uh, and those could be on your mobile phone. So how do you build an app? We have power apps that can build, you can rapidly build low code, no code type of ways that you can build certain types of applications. If you want to surface this up during the pandemic, you know, no, no one was reinventing the wheel. Everyone was trying to leverage what was out there. A lot of it was Power BI, just great, fantastic resources to be able to showcase how this is. And Teams for Telehealth. So again, just a whole array of different tools, all interconnected, fire enabled, made available to our partners and to anyone that wants to use them. And it's something that's now interconnected with EHRs, connected with the different systems. So again, that's just like one example of how you can leverage the full range of different tools that Microsoft offers. And that, that's just something that I think startups need to start thinking about that, you know, let's not just focus on getting a single purpose uh, partner, but a partner that can do a lot of different things. You know, beyond... Microsoft, it can feel these days like the, the, the tech options, this platform options, are it's drinking from a fire hose. There are just so many things out there being developed that someone can take advantage of. You just named a whole raft of things that Microsoft's doing and said, don't reinvent the wheel. And yet your standard founder is, you know, dealing with, with daily fires and, you know, doesn't necessarily have the bandwidth, the research, what you know, what Microsoft or somebody else is doing to know that, you know, there's a better platform that's been developed. It can be hard to know that the tools are even out there. So do you have recommendations or strategies for founders for just knowing what's available, knowing what they shouldn't reinvent? Yeah. And, and I think this is a, a great point because I think most organizations, most founders immediately look for the, for the immediate fix. I need to find a place to put my data. So they look for 
you know, a, a cloud storage place. They, their decision might be on-prem versus cloud. You know, th these are all decisions that down the road have implications of their ability to be able to build and become much more nimble uh, and to scale. You know, as you think about the different types of cloud vendors and different opportunities, you, you know, I've mentioned, you know, this is an area that we've spent a significant amount of time looking at. It's also the philosophy. You know, if you think about who you want to partner with. Microsoft, our philosophy is we don't own the data. We don't monetize it. You know, essentially the data is yours. We, we try to enable, we try to support, we don't compete. Uh, and I think that's something that's important to realize that, you know, if you're looking for a company that wants to, you want to be with, uh, not just for the next few years, but perhaps, you know, as you think beyond, you know, the next few years into perhaps to the IPO, <laughs> um, this is the time of uh, where I think a company like Microsoft allows you to be able to scale. So depending on your need, you know, we're, we're an organization that is designed around companies, small, medium, and large. You know, you've mentioned the word uh, partnering multiple times, and I might think of working with Microsoft as more of a commercial relationship, a vendor relationship, but you, you, you really have been framing it around the, the idea of partnership. Great to hear that that is uh, an avenue. You mentioned building on a cloud for healthcare as being, you know, one thing that you would look for. Other areas of focus that Microsoft for startups is looking for? Other aspects of the business that if you're building on would make you a good partner? Yeah, it really depends on what your business is. Uh, there are some, I'd say most are looking, you know, create solutions, uh, but there are some startups that are more infrastructure based. And in that case, we would look to figure out ways to plug you into specific partnerships or activities where we think that your attributes or your, your technologies can be very helpful. Uh, and, and so it's exposure, exposure to try to understand where your, your technology best fits. We, within the Microsoft healthcare space, cover a broad range of different, I'll say sectors, hospitals, health systems, you know, provider is one, payer is another, life sciences is another, med tech is another, and retail. And so all of those are pretty broad areas. And a lot of times we find that startups just don't have the bandwidth to be able to start looking to secure partnerships. Uh, and it could be with very large organizations or it could be with some smaller or medium-sized ones. But we have relationships across the globe uh, pre with pretty much every enterprise company. And I'd say in most cases, um, they are eager to find ways to continue to build off of their existing investments into the platforms that we're building with them. Thinking even broader than the specific tech stacks that Microsoft is focusing on, just given your vantage point, where are you you seeing the biggest opportunities in, in health tech today? Well, I think if you look at the merging trends, that's a good starting point. Uh, one of the biggest trends we, we see today is around consumerism. You know, this focus on the consumer, the end user, it be, whether it be the patient slash consumer, changing the user experience so it's more seamless. That also ties directly into the user experience for providers. We know clinician burnout is a huge area. So I think that that's something that clearly represents a big opportunity. Uh, as we think about expanding care across the care continuum, and we start thinking about virtual care and how AI and virtual care can be combined. We started with telehealth. I think that's, that's a tremendous starting point. Remote monitoring, also a very important point. But where we're moving towards is actually around how all these different data sets can be brought together and we can be much more predictive in terms of our actions. So, you know, I'd say that that's an emerging area. Another area is uh, one that I think we see every day in the news and it's around health equity. You know, as we think about understanding the challenges that we have today in terms of providing care to the underserved, a large part of what everyone's trying to do is they're trying to provide care that is equitably distributed. But in that, in many cases, we need to start focusing on underlying infrastructure, whether it be broadband access or affordable broadband access, education, digital training, and then also, of course, just being able to provide uh, the services that people need the most. Uh, and these are some basic services being brought to communities that are underserved. So I think, you know, large part, big trends represent opportunities for organizations, whether they be small, medium, or large. Are, are those trends things that you see Microsoft uh, directing their attention at in the future? I'm just curious about kind of where fighting health inequities sort of fits into the Microsoft vision and some of the things that get you excited uh, along those thoughts. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I love Microsoft is we actually try to address all of those, the, the big ticket items. And, and I'll just give you some examples. As I think about health equity, one of the challenges today we face uh, relates to just vaccinations, you know, and providing vaccinations in an equitable manner across the globe. Uh, and what we found also is that even within the United States, uh, the ability for us to be able to ensure that 
the most vulnerable and those in underserved areas are getting the vaccines. Now, it's not just about access. It actually is now about the conversations that you need to have with the individuals to address their concerns. And that has to be married into the process. So what we've been doing is we've been building public-private partnerships uh, that leverage our existing relationships and new relationships that we've forged with public health, healthcare, and local entities. And those are the entities that need to be talking together. And the data needs to flow between those. So we're building some of the infrastructure that supports data flow between communities and public health and hospitals and health systems. I wonder if you could break down that that public-private strategy a little bit more. And I wonder if there's some learnings there for startups in terms of how they collaborate and who they collaborate with. Well, I think one of the things we oftentimes do is we default back to hospitals and health systems as the primary driver for a lot of the innovations. And, and maybe we'll look at payers as the, the organization that will pay, or, or, or maybe it's a life science company that will pay. But what we're oftentimes finding is that the areas where there's significant amount of investment are in areas that we may not have been looking at. Uh, the public sector right now, there's a significant amount of investment being made to rebuild that. That's an opportunity for startups to start looking at how they can help rebuild those uh, and, and address the ongoing challenges. Uh, you know, just recently, we were involved in vaccination events across the country. Uh, there, there aren't significant tools today for community health workers to be able to uh, run these events. And so we've been trying to you know, build these on the fly, but another opportunity for startups to be able to inter, in, in, you know, intervene. So I think um, sometimes opportunities lie in places you don't expect them because there's not money there today, but with investments, there will be. I think that's, I think that's good advice. David, I want to switch gears a minute and talk a bit about global health because I know that's a, a passion of yours. I understand you've been involved with the WHO with their COVID efforts. And so tell me a little bit more about that work, uh, what you're doing with the WHO, what you, what Microsoft did do, because I think it really aligns beautifully with Startup Health's Health Moonshot thesis. When the pandemic started, we were in active discussions already with the WHO in terms of revitalizing or, or um, for refortifying their platform. It really wasn't even refortifying. It was just building their platform. <laughs> they, they didn't have anything. Uh, it was largely spreadsheets and just uh, a bunch of pieces of paper across the globe. And they needed a central place, a data lake for us to be stored. And the data lake had to be structured in ways that it could communicate with the different countries and the different people in the different areas. And what we did was we accelerated that by co-investing with them into this. And we essentially built their, it's called a single uh, data repository, uh, which is responsible for managing all their processes. Uh, it is now going to be a core part of their three billions effort. Three billions, essentially 1 billion individuals for whom there'll be new uh, access to care provided. Another billion for whom uh, medical emergencies can be better managed, uh, including COVID uh, and other types of infectious outbreaks down the road. And then another in terms of managing chronic disease. And so as we've been looking at this, this is something that the WHO has had on their wish list for quite some time. Uh, COVID was the opportunity for us to all lean in and, and build that with them. And we've been excited to be a part of their ongoing efforts to continue to refine this and, and look at ways that we can uh, work with them and other organizations to be able to uh, integrate this into other existing processes globally. Given that experience and your, your vantage point, I wonder if you could speak to kind of the new opportunities that exist for healthcare startups to expand globally, to think globally, to uh, think about what they're building and how it really could reverberate in, in other continents. I think most people know that, you know, having a global reach is, is fantastic, but is also daunting because every country uh, and even regions within country have rules. <laughs> they have rules around where data resides, governance. Just look at GDPR as, as like one example. Uh, you know, we, we find is that even within the U.S., there's just so many aspects of, of care that need to be addressed. Everything from how the data gets managed to uh, FDA to reimbursement rules, which then go not at only, only at the federal, but state and then, of course, you've got uh, commercial payers. Uh, I mean, just it gets very complicated when you start looking at how to put it all together. So I would say uh, find one area that you can start, get it right, uh, and then start thinking about how you can scale to other regions or other parts that 
are maybe not a huge step away, but similar. Uh, but then at, once you've gotten to the point where you've got enough infrastructure in place, then start thinking about how you can scale it to other places. But yeah, global is always the, the ultimate goal, but probably not step one. What do you feel like are the next big re regulatory shifts that folks in this call should be thinking about, preparing for, uh, that might be coming down the road, I don't know, in 2022? Well, I was involved in some of the early work with the FDA on their FDA pre-cert program. And that was a program that I think has created a huge opportunity for us to start thinking about how digital technologies will be deployed. If you think about what's happened since the uh, initiation of that program, you have now companies like Apple that have taken a consumer product and then allowed for software to be classified as a medical device and be placed on top of that Apple Watch. Now, interestingly enough, the Apple Watch is not an FDA clear device. It's the software on top of it that is. So this separation of software as a medical device on top of consumer device hardware is actually now a major trend and opportunity. And, but the challenge, what we're starting to see is how do you keep those algorithms current and updated? And so this new era of AI and looking at how AI algorithms can be treated as software as a medical device, and then how do we then capture data you know, post-market or release and then bring that data into the evaluation to determine if these algorithms are working as designed for the populations that they're being applied in. So AI in the context of software as a medical device, another huge opportunity. And this is an area where right now the FDA and other regulatory bodies are still trying to figure it out because there's a lot of moving parts. Technology is advancing very quickly. You know, our, our capabilities are, 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 are much greater than they used to be before. And we're starting to see a greater rise of consumerism where consumers expect and want this type of technology on their devices. And as we start seeing solutions being built that allow us to be able to tap into all of this, we have to work together. And that's why the FDA oftentimes convenes and works directly with industry to be able to better understand how we can, how they can build standards or apply standards that will allow us to be able to find that right balance between safety and nimbleness. Um, in the name of moving from sort of more global, more strategic to as specific and practical as we can, David, I want to throw you a, a curveball and say that if you had to quit your job today and someone gave you the funds to start a health tech startup tomorrow and you had to start a company, I, I want to know what area you'd want to start it in, what technology you would use to make the most of what you think is the greatest a business opportunity in the market today? Yeah, again, I may not be the best example because I, I go where my heart is. Uh, I see so much suffering today due to COVID. Uh, and I, uh, I would want to find some way to address that suffering. I'm a okay. firm believer that a lot of times when you build the solutions that people want and need, the business models will come about. Now you have to be smart about it. You can't, you know, you can't assume that it'll always happen. You know, I would rather try to solve an acute, very painful need uh, and, and then find, find whether or not the business models will meet that. So that would be the area I'd focus on. I'd, I'd focus on trying to address the ongoing challenges of the pandemic. What's the element of the Microsoft tech stack that you would be most excited to utilize as part of your tool? Well, right now there's a starting point. We do in a large part of our ability to intervene with vaccinations, we can stand up vaccination clinics uh, anywhere in a parking lot in a church. Uh, it's through a, pro it's a program that we've developed called the Mac Microsoft Vaccination Management System. Mm -hmm. It allows for registration, scheduling, data to be captured securely, brought into immunization registries, EHRs. We've added the capabilities to do childhood and adult immunizations on top of that. Um, I think that that's an opportunity for that type of technology to be deployed in underserved areas and become a foundational piece for how we deliver community care. Uh, to the underserved. So I, I feel like that's a huge opportunity right now. There are so many individuals that don't receive the care that they need to, and we have technologies that will allow us to be able to do that. I love it. Dr. Rue, this is your chance to kind of give some parting wisdom to the folks in this call. There's a few dozen founders here and, and many more will listen to this on YouTube. And, you know, this is your chance to sort of look back over your experience and the startups you've worked with and say, uh, September 2021, what are some of the core pieces of wisdom and strategy that you wish everyone on this call would know? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, there have been so many lessons learned, but one that 
certain resonates very strongly with me is the need to constantly innovate and stay one step ahead of the game. What we oftentimes find is that we will find a solution for something. And by the time we start getting it out there to the market, the market shifted. And our solution for a variety of reasons is not quite exactly what the industry was asking for. So to be nimble, to be able to adjust, to be able to make sure that you're always looking ahead, you know, similar to what Wayne Gretzky said, skate, said, you know, skate to where the puck's going, not to where it's at. And I think that that's largely what I have taken away, you know, trying to stay one step ahead, understand where the regulations are going, where the industry's going, and also make sure that your technology does what it's supposed to do. What are your strategies for staying nimble and staying one step ahead? I mean, what, what do you read? How do you, how do you stay ready? Well, I think a large part of it is just like conversations that I have with people in the field. I mean, I, I learn a lot just by talking to people and their challenges and understanding what they've done and what their suggestions are. They oftentimes are the ones with the answers, but they just don't have the tools or resources to be able to do it. So the more that you talk to people, the more that you learn, the more that you understand more than one perspective also, because uh, sometimes you just hear from one organization or one group about their challenge and it doesn't really reflect a broader sense of what's going on. Uh, specifically in terms of the broader market. So talk to a lot of people, uh, try to get a, a broad view, uh, but also uh, clearly I, social media uh, has been a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to leverage the fact that, you know, there are people out there with incredible insights. I learn a lot just by following some folks that I had never even met uh, in person, but, you know, digitally, I, I see a lot of things that they post and I, I'm pretty impressed with what they have to share. So, you know, I, I learn a lot through digital means as well. I think it's a great way to close. I think my big insight was just really understanding when to not reinvent the wheel. And it can be hard to know what tools exist, but to do the work to understand, hey, what's been built already? What can I build on top of something else and still maintain my IP, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's something else? Know what's been built out there and know when you can kind of skip ahead a little bit, right? Wonderful to have you with us, Dr. Rue. I know you have a, a busy schedule and there's a lot of other things that you can do. So we appreciate you spending the last hour with us. Thanks to all the health transformers who got on the call. We're going to make sure we have resources from this session, like contact information in the uh, YouTube episode and in the blog post. So you can look forward to that. And uh, I hope you come back and see us again next week, Tuesday, September 21st, for a session with Diana Chapman, the author of The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, and then a session uh, the week after that on the 28th, where we will be sharing updates from the Startup Health team and the Startup Health platform. But uh, let me just close by saying that, Dr. Rue, uh, thank you for your wisdom, uh, your candor and for, for joining us for today's Fireside Chat. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. All right. Be well, everybody. We'll see you next week.